Oh, hello there. You know, the famous American author Flannery O'Connor once said, where you come from is gone, where you're going to never was there, and where you are is no good unless you can get away from it. Those are words that probably would have rung very true with today's subject. His life and O'Connor's life being inextricably bound together by a strange avenue of fate. This is the Righteous Bojambo, and it's time to talk about Blind Willie McTell. It's a safe bet to say that there are few, if any, musics at the core of the Western popular canon which are as romanticised, as mythologised, as narratively inbred and as expansive, flexible and yet easily recognised as the blues. As we've touched on in early editions, the blues as we knew it first emerged as a song form at the start of the 20th century under the patronage of W.C. Handy and remained either the semi-literate country cousin of jazz or the slightly odious novelty for white hipsters of the day up until 1921, when Mamie Smith took the form above ground with Crazy Blues and All Hell in the best possible way broke loose. Our looks at the essential selections of the 1920s and 30s introduced us to some of the key artists in the early blues and in both editions there was one name which stood at the forefront of ancient and fundamental blues men, the man whom, in my opinion, is the greatest of the acoustic generation, Blind Willie McTell. Born in 1898 in Thompson, Georgia, near Augusta, as William McTeer, or so they say, very little about McTell's early life is established, Willie was born blind to a 14-year-old mother and a father who was gone free as the Georgia breeze. His mother relocated to Statesboro when Willie was nine. It was there that fate, in its usual guise as cultural, social and economic factors, touched first upon Willie's life. After the Civil War and into the Reconstruction, the rural black experience was one of poverty, isolation and cultural depredation. Black culture was illustrated and propagandised through the lens of the minstrel show, which were music and comedic cavalcades displaying life in the sunny south, where the only roles available for black folk were as indolent, raised toten darkies or as fast-talking zip coons, lazy, godless and dishonourable in intent. By the time Willie was born, black people had pretty much abandoned minstrelsy, at the cost of leaving behind them as a relic of shame, one of the most important artefacts connecting them with their African heritage, but also used to mock them in the minstrel shows, the banjo. Fortunately, and perhaps as a response to this, three profoundly influential figures were just moving in to refocus black musical identity. As we mentioned before, W.C. Handy in Memphis was first codifying the musical structure of the blues. Down in New Orleans, the ghostly Buddy Bolden first wove his magic. And in Chicago, one of the, in my opinion, bare handful of genuine geniuses of American popular music, Scott Joplin, was at first formulating ragtime, but also reaching to write serious African-American folk operas. But these were all galaxies away from the Carolinas, Georgia, East Texas, and the Mississippi Delta, where the black folk tradition lived on the strongest and was most in need of continuation. In the case of Georgia, it was good old American capitalism that came to the rescue. At the end of the Civil War, as Sherman marched through Georgia, his troops destroyed most of northern Georgia's railway infrastructure, and by most I mean all. After the Reconstruction, the northern carpetbaggers swarmed over the Old South looking for opportunities. 
Spurred on by the Panic of 1893, the king of the carpetbaggers, J.P. Morgan, started sweeping up and extending railroad licenses, which hastened communications through the region. As the rural routes began to expand, the U.S. Postal Service followed, increasing northern Georgia postal routes a thousandfold between 1894 and 1904. And where there were railroads and where there was post, there followed one of the great ubiquities of American life. Sears Roebuck catalogue. And it was through the catalogue that rural African Americans had access to inexpensive stringed instruments, especially the guitar, which may have been denied to them by white storekeepers. So thus was the banjo replaced in the communal tradition of teaching songs and the playing of them amongst the group perpetuated. And it was via one of these guitars which Willie obtained, either through begging or purloining, that he was able to apply himself to the street music and rags which he was exposed to in more populous, prosperous Statesboro. By the end of World War I, Willie was established as a street entertainer in Statesboro, but his beloved mother passed away. A neighbour, taking pity on blind Willie, paid for him to be sent to a school for the blind in Macon, where he proved to be a ready study and he later attended schools for the blind in Michigan and New York. But in 1924, another of those collusions of circumstance again intruded on Willie's life. The boll weevil swept across the agricultural south and smaller rural towns like Thompson and particularly Statesboro suffered harshly. Willie, like so many others, swept off the land headed for the city. In this case, a town he felt held the key to his fortune and he called home for the rest of his life, Atlanta. Unfortunately for Willie, Atlanta wasn't the promised land a city thoroughly controlled by the Ku Klux Klan, where black folks were forced to live in a 10 square block ghetto fronted by Decatur Street. The only silver lining in this was that the ghetto was a hub for the southern black musical community, amongst whom Willie was quick to rise to preeminence by singing on the streets, at rent parties, at the all-black shows at the 81 Theater and in church at the famous Mount Zion Baptist Church where Willie would from time to time in later years do some preaching. As we previously discussed, Blind Blake was the boss of Ragtime Guitar and it was interest in his records which had the label setting up offices all across the Carolinas and Georgia looking for another dose of lightning to bottle. By 1927, their Victrollers ensconced in parlours across the south, the Victor Company decided that Blind Willie was the peculiar lightning that they wanted to bottle. From his first session in October 1927, Willie would lay down sighs that came to define the Piedmont Blues. Rags, spirituals, dance numbers, political folk songs, primitive complaining songs and heavy deep southern style blues. He did this while developing a language within his songs, an argot built up from post-reconstruction black slang, hips to jive from the Atlantic ghetto, sound bites from firebrand pulpiteers, southern grotesque, and an elevated expression of the existentialist condition that constituted the blues. But by 1930, Willie had his traveling shoes back on. The Depression, another combination of factors beyond Willie's making, forced a lot of the labels to shut down their local offices. So Willie left to ramble and recorded for whoever and whenever he could. He recorded in Atlanta, New York and Chicago under nine different names for ten different labels. But by 1936, Willie had pretty much fallen out of fashion as a recording artist and was not to return to a proper studio for 13 years. Black audiences were gravitating away from rural sounds to the modern urban sounds of dance bands and Willie was reduced to hustling for quarters on the Atlanta streets or in the parking lot of the Pig and Whistle Grill to making a pilgrimage to Statesboro for the tobacco auctions in the hope of making enough money to last the season. Through the good years and the bad, Willie recorded around 120 sides. His key recordings leave a legacy as rich as anyone's in the pre-war blues not just as great songs, but as great performances. Like 1927's Mama Tain Long for Day, with Willie playing the slide in the Deep South style, which would have been rarely heard up north at that point. 
or 1928's Jumpin' Statesboro Blues with Willie pleading, cajoling, negotiating his woman back with its spectacular sixth verse, a masterwork of blues both in metaphor and performance. There was 1929's Contract Dodger, Come Over to My House, where Willie shows off his mastery of ragtime guitar. Then in 1930, Razor Ball, which saw Willie at his gruesome and poetic best, with Slewfoot Mose and Cross-Eyed Joe bearing witness to Craps Game Carnage. 1931 bought perhaps his masterpiece, Broke Down Engine Blues, in which he deconstructs the human condition and all its perversity, and analyzes a man possessed by a spirit of movement who cannot move. 1931 also saw him under the name of Georgia Bill cut Georgia Rag and another masterwork in the scarifying Scary Day Blues, in which Willie finds himself trapped in the third of those Flannery O'Connor purgatories. 1933 he cut the B&O blues, Willie turns the table on his hot mama at last. He misses the child but he can't use her no more. He's got Fair Brown walking the floor in Charm City don't you know, accompanied by the mysterious and long unissued, you was born to die. After his unsuccessful session in New York for Vercallion, Willie spent a few years away from recording but reappeared on Decker in Chicago in 1936. Your Time to Worry sees Willie incandescent with apocalyptic fervor and bloodlust, and cerise with cynicism on its B-side, Willie's Hillbilly Blues. In 1940, he took the derisory sum of $10 to record in a hotel room for John Lomax, a group of recordings that ended up in the Library of Congress. And it wasn't until 1949, when no less than Ahmed Erdogan sought out Willie to recut some of his classics for Atlantic, that he went back into the studio to cut 15 sides, two of which were issued, Kill It Kid and Broke Down Engine, as Barrel House Sammy. In 1950, there were some unsuccessful sessions for Regal, and six years later came the travesty of his final sessions, recorded drop down drunk in the back room of a record store on 13th Street in Atlanta, procured for the princely cost of a bottle of malt liquor. Like it seems a great blues man should, Willie died a sad and lonesome death. He was hell-bound and down by the end of 1958. Drunk, confused and weary, he suffered a stroke that cost him the power of speech. His caregiver Helen died shortly after and Willie, lost and alone, lit out for Thompson to die with his kin. He got a little better, he got his speech back, but it was there that he suffered a second calamitous stroke and he died in the hospital in Milledgeville. Coincidentally, the hometown of your humble narrator's favourite author, Flannery O'Connor. They took him back to Thompson to bury him, where a stupid stonemason mistakenly carved a tombstone with the name of Willie's father on it, a man he barely ever knew. His possessions, all his guitars and suits, were stored in a shack in Thompson. A few weeks later, waiting for his wife, it's complicated, to come and collect them, the shack burned down. So apart from a handful of shellac records, almost every earthly trace of Blind Willie McTell, including his very name, was gone to ash and dust in less than a month. Since Willie's reconstitution in the late 1960s and early 70s at the hands of Taj Mahal, Roy Cooter and the Allman Brothers and his ongoing championeering, is championeering a word? By Bob Dylan and Jack White thereafter, it seems to be a particular and persistent argument about Willie's place in the firmament of 1930s blues singers, especially vis-a-vis -vis Robert Johnson. Of course, Willie lacks a little in the charisma state, living to the relatively ripe old blues age of 61, and despite this inconveniently dying just before the folk boom that would rediscover and superannuate so many of his contemporaries. Another reason McTell seemingly lags behind Johnson in celebrity is that there's been no Grammy Award winning repackaging of his complete works, due in part to the fact that his recorded output is so scattergun whereas Johnson's would probably fit on a CD. Lots of people credit Robert Johnson with being the first writer to bring a genuine psychological narrative form by introducing archetypal psychological themes to the blues, but Willie McTell played the game on a far more intensely internal level in some kind of 
twisted psychic funfair carving bizarre new parables for new and bizarre times. He was a, a manic Kafka to Johnson's brooding Dostoevsky. Johnson sounded positively biblical and ancient, but Bechtel was always as relentlessly modern as the troubled world he sang about. For example, in Broke Down Engine Blues, he sang the song of a man being pushed to a precipice, confronting disaster, but he doesn't have a place to go. It's the song of a man who doesn't believe in God, but calls out for him anyway, just for the comfort in the sound of the word, approving of the sacred syllables by flame. It's a man blaming ancient devils in a modern world which are consuming him. The world is ending, floodwaters are rising, his woman's gone, he can't even put a pistol to his head. Poor Willie. Of course, a man like Blind Willie foresaw no legacy. He had no notion of being a catalogue artist. He wasn't superannuated and had no monetized fan base. He appears in no high concept long form video. He's not even Blind Willie McTell seven days a week. He's Blind Sammy here, Hotshot Bill there, Pig and Whistle Red the next day. He's even buried in a grave Mark Eddie McTeer. He sings as a man deep in the policy game, cold in hand, consumed there by here and now, finding that hell is full of fortune tellers and recidivist democrats, and heaven is full of blank checks and statues. Willie stared into the madness and he wrote fantastical blues about it. Willie was a prophet of his days. He was a man who couldn't be shackled by his blindness or his circumstances. It is convenient to quote Bob Dylan when he said, nobody could sing the blues like blind Willie McTell. And he didn't mean Willie was the heavyweight champ. He was just a real gone cat who couldn't see the world. So he naturally looked at it askance. And old Bob, well, it ain't often he's wrong, but he's right this time. There was only one ever. Blind Willie McTell. Guten Morgen, meine Freunde. I hope you found today's presentation to be interesting and that it piqued your curiosity. I strongly recommend you check out the playlist for this week's offering um, because it will prove enlightening in terms of the story we've just told. Until the next time we gather together in good fellowship or until the nasty YouTube police shut the channel down, just remember you can't know where it's at until you know where you've been. Hello there. Oh, no, you adjusted. I'm, I can act any time.